What's Love up, people? Radio. <clears throat> Greetings, Earthlings. So, I don't know what I'm about to say, but I know that it's something worth hearing. Just pour myself a little shot of rum. Kick this bad boy off. Cheers. <sighs> All right. I'm going to have to do another shot in a minute here. I don't know if I do that a lot. I'm going to try to cut down on the... Because I know it sounds kind of annoying when you're listening to the uh, podcast. So what am I going to talk to you about today? Who doesn't like romance? The answer? Assholes. Who probably became assholes because they were hurt by, uh, by some romance gone awry. So... Today's episode, we're going to kind of delve into some romantic business. I have no guests right now. I will have a guest on the next episode, but I felt some inspiration, so I wanted to hop on the mic and see what happens. Now, on my way to work today, and I work at a gym. Okay, so I, I did a... Did you hear that? Um, so I'm going to have to obfuscate certain details of my life now that I have an actual job and I have some semblance of a adult life to defend the honor of. So, uh, you know, I'm going to twist and turn some details uh, to protect myself and more importantly to protect those I talk about. So let's just say I work for a little gym called 25 Hour Fitness in a city called Lee's um, Hill in the state of Mississippi. And uh, so I'm on my way in my Lexus GS for not 30, to work, and I uh, get a call. I don't answer phone calls for the most part because I still have PTSD from collection agencies calling me to the point where my phone would die on a daily basis. So anytime the phone rings, I expect the worst. Worst. Um, so phone rings, for some reason... Nico's feeling a little crazy. I slide that finger to the right, answer that call, right? It is uh, basically social services. I don't remember the exact name. But I had put in an application for disability months back, probably three, four, maybe five months ago. I have a horrible understanding of time. So somewhere in the span of two to 72 months ago, I put in an application for disability. I felt bad in doing so because I'm obviously an an able-bodied young man of uh, impeccable physique and uh, above-average mental acumen. There's no reason a guy like me can't uh, make his way in this this wonderful nation of ours, right? I don't need to be collecting government cheese, homie. But the thing is, I kind of maybe do because I have a serious disability. Um, I like to call it a... um, I don't don't like calling it a disability. I think I said that already. No, I I said I don't like calling it a mood disorder. I like calling it a mood reorder. But no matter how you spruce it up, it is an issue when it comes to trying to make a life in this world in a modern society, modern culture, and... uh, it's a disability in that sense, and that it's very hard for me to function the way the average Joe can. So uh, I this was coming out of a period of financial, um, I think it's safe to call it Armageddon, and I really needed some money. And I, I had collected unemployment for a little while, I thought that went relatively well. So let's see, you know, there's disability. I have a disability. Let's see what happens. So I I put in for it. I fill out paperwork. There's more paperwork comes. I fill out the paperwork. You know, I kind of forget about it. 
I get it. I get this job at Twenty Five Hour Fitness in Lee's Hill, Mississippi, and I, you know, I have a job now, so I don't need to worry about the disability. But the thing's still filed, so they call me and ask how things are going. Like there was like an upcoming doctor visit I have to go to, and they have to like take a look at me and be like, "Yeah, man, this guy's this guy's crazy. Give him that money." Or, "Nah, man, this guy's trying to milk that system. This some bitch." Um, I think I fall somewhere in between that spectrum. So anyway, I, hey, I said anyway and still anyway. I normally say anyway. I, I, I don't know if I want to let go of my roots. So anyway, I, um, I get this call, I answer it, and they, they ask me how it's going. I tell them that I have a job now and that I'm, I'm working, you know, 30 something hours a week and making X amount of money. Uh, not a lot. I don't even want to say not to protect myself because it's not as much as I want to be making. But, you know, it's more than I've made in the past. It's, it's okay. And, um, so, I tell them what's up and they're like, okay, great. Um, we're gonna basically chuck it in the bin, but you could reapply if there's an issue. Next time maybe it won't take so long because, you know, there was a lot of debate whether your thing was a real thing and whether we should just blah, 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 you know. So uh, I'm like, all right, cool. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to milk the system. And uh, I, I say that because I just remembered that that happened today. And, and it ties back to what I'm thinking on the way home from work that day. And so I, I go to work. It works going well. I like my job. I'm convincing people to join the gym, do something that's good for themselves. I enjoy the interaction i enjoy the sales process the becoming a good salesman is really giving me tools that i'm going to use for the rest of my life not just in business but in human interaction but specifically in my business and i i'm a screenwriter i write movies and they're very good the stories i create but i don't know how to sell them i don't have someone to sell them for me and so that's a big part of the reason, at least that's what I tell myself and I believe myself, that that I haven't really uh, become what we would call a uh, millionaire. And so I'm trying to incorporate what everything I learn into everything I do. And uh, sales is, is being a hell of a thing to get better at, especially face-to-face -face sales. Um, and I really believe in what I'm selling, so it goes well. And so. How does this tie in? Good question. So I'm enjoying the sales process. What I like about it is that it's one of few places, experiences, moments in modern society and culture. It's one of few places in, in the modern human experience where it is permissible to step outside the bounds of politeness, to step outside the bounds of mutual professionalism to step outside the bounds of just bullshit, I guess. You can call people out on things. You can try you, you can say stuff like, hey, come on man. What are we really here talking about? What is it you really want? Why did you come in here today? Is your wife you really need to talk to your wife? You know, if I can't convince you to join a gym, how are you going to convince your wife to join a gym? Let's be real, Timothy. Do you want your wife to be a killer whale? We can knock her down to Orca in three months. Give only a year. We're going to make her a dolphin, bro. You just need to buy this personal training. So that, that's a little taste of, uh, of necromanetic action. <laughs> so, so, slightly hyperbolic, but I enjoy being able to disrobe the the normal human interactions. I like realness, I guess. And, and sales is one of the few places where you can be real outside of art. So I enjoy that. And you get to connect with people on a level you don't generally get to connect with people. And that's cool. Kind of like what I'm doing right now. I get to connect with you, uh, admittedly one way, but I get to connect with you in a way that I normally wouldn't and the people normally wouldn't connect and you're connecting with me even though I can't uh, feel it or uh, really understand it clearly unless you're 
writing in or calling in or talking to you and telling me about it. But there's a connection here that's going on that transcends the normal human connections. We're talking about things and going places that you wouldn't normally go. And we're on an adventure together. I'm going to take another shot of rum. <sighs> Bam. All right. So I like sales is what we were saying. Now, let's go to how this particular call came about. So uh, as part of my job with 25-Hour Fitness, I occasionally go out of the gym and do what we like to call outside lead hunting, where I will take a bunch of flyers or, you know, little cards they make up, uh, the stuff corporate gives us, and I, I will go around to local businesses, hand it out, grab a card that proves I went somewhere and I wasn't, like, smoking the J in my car, and I uh, just interact with people and trying to get them to come into the gym. And I really hated doing it at first because I don't know that there's many things that are more demeaning than door-to-door sales, especially when you have an advanced degree and you're uh, a self-proclaimed genius. You don't want to be knocking on doors, man. But I got over it and I reframed it, I guess. And I just walked into a particular store and there was a particular girl and she was working and I knew right away I liked her before I even said a word to her. And uh, she was on the phone with someone and uh, with her I'm actually not going to give any details. I'm not going to uh, tongue-in-cheek it, if you will, on this on this lady, because I like her. And so we, we proceeded to have an exciting, interesting, fun conversation. Well, I try to convince her to come into this gym. She gives me all the reasons she can't, and I uh, knock them down one by one in a, in a fun and joyful way. And we have a really fun exchange. And so... Um, I give her a call from work today. It's been some time has passed. I don't remember exactly how much time. I would sent her a follow-up email that day from my fictional assistant, Jack White. Oh, I mean my assistant, Jack White. And, um, you yeah, know, she didn't respond, so I was thinking, like, okay, well, that was fine. She thought it was cute, and that's it. But, yeah, I, I gave her a ring today. Um, because I had to be given rings. I had to give, like, 50 rings a day. I got to... You know, it's it's like I'm having 40 Olympics. I got to get 50 rings a day, and the math's not correct. And that's a weird joke thing I just made. But what I'm saying is, I have to call a lot of people. And why not call a person you like? Well, you're calling a lot of people, most of whom you don't like or don't know or don't give a shit about. I give a shit about this girl, so I call her. Um. I, I don't know if I should say it because it gives away what she does. Anyways, I, I, I pretend to be like a potential customer. And um, and she catches on after like 30 seconds and, and she knows it's me. And uh, I applaud her for that. I was impressed. But uh, yeah, so basically I, um, I asked if she would like to have another conversation like we were having before, but not maybe not about a gym membership, and uh, maybe involving us eating food at the same time. So she asked, uh, Nico, are you asking me on a date? To which I respond by kicking back in my chair and putting my feet against the wall and leaning back and grinning and uh, saying, yeah, yeah. And she tells me that she, I don't remember the exact word, but, she, you know, she likes that I'm asking that. Let's just, uh, let's just clarify that. She she definitely liked that I asked her out. And, and, and just by the way she asked if I was asking her out, I was like, yeah, that chick digs me. Um, she tells me she has a boyfriend, right? And normally I would have probably said, oh, I understand. You know, uh, may have even said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I shouldn't have uh, so, yeah, I hope you're very happy to get a very lucky man. Uh, you know, something 
along those lines. And uh, but now that I'm in sales, I uh, I realize that uh, what you think people are always lying, basically liars are buyers, and people are lying to you and they're lying to themselves, and they may or may not know that they're lying to you and lying to themselves. And um, sales is a process of, of taking those lies and and kind of gradually disintegrating them till we get to the truth. And the truth is where the sale happens. And the truth is where the magic is. And so the truth with her I knew wasn't just that she has a boyfriend. That made it true. But there's a need there. There's a want there because she wouldn't have talked to me again. Like she wouldn't have flirted with me. She wouldn't have been happy I called and she wouldn't have asked if I was asking that. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm being a little too arrogant and presumptuous. But what I'm saying is that I I identified a want she has. And she wants what I was giving her. That entertainment. That uh, fun. That excitement. And... I wanted to give it to her, and I enjoyed it. And um, so we both want the same thing. Now it's a question of what are the obstacles, what is preventing us from having that? And so instead of just saying, oh, I understand, you know, how are you mean? What I say is, um, okay, I understand that. Let me just ask you a question. Do you love him? That's what I said, for real. Real talk, that's what I said. Pause, and she laughed a little. And uh, I just wait for a response, and she says, very nice. And at this point, they just smile on Nico's face because everyone knows very nice. (laughs) It's a few steps from my love. And so I tell her... um, I thought something was there. Anyways, I uh, I tell her, okay, he's very nice. Okay, that's yeah, you know, it's better than being not nice. It's better than being just nice. It's better than some poor. Uh, you know, it's good good ways from love, but uh, good that you got someone who's very nice in your life. But uh, you know, how about someone you can just uh have a good conversation with? And, uh, you know, yeah, I don't remember exactly how I spun it, but it, but it obviously the way I spun it worked because she said that I could stop by and have lunch with her. And, um, yeah, she gave me permission to see her again, basically, which is cool, I think. Uh, I should know she's a little older than me, not uh, substantially so to the point it's weird, but she's a good five, six years older than me. Uh, she's a kind of a little bit of a different stage in her life. She may or may not have a kid. And, um, you know, I. but I was happy because uh, whatever aside, I a person I like being around wants to be around, even though on paper she probably shouldn't be around if she's following the rules. And it's cool that um, she wants to break those rules with me. And... And maybe we would end up dating. Maybe we would end up getting married. And maybe we would end up having kids. Maybe this and that. And, you know, normally my brain would be going through those simulations. And admittedly, they didn't do to an extent. But it brought up for me while I was driving home and thinking about her. And now I'm thinking, uh, and here's the screenwriter in me. I'm imagining these different scenes, these different options we have, these different ways this lunch could play out. Maybe I uh, I, I go to like this Chinese restaurant. Uh, this guy I signed up uh, for the gym owns it, and I get him to like let me have the the in-house silverware and plates and set up and get bring that to her work. And then it's like, what? How does guy bring the that stuff, instead of just the go containers, this guy is uh, that's a provider right there. That's a guy who can pull some strings. I'm uh, doing some traction. You know, maybe I maybe I cook something. Maybe I, I cook something really nice. It's a beautiful arrangement. I bring it in. I, I made I made food for her. Maybe it needs to be heated up. Guess what? I brought a microwave. It's in my car. I'm gonna go hook that up. 
you know, just little little things, little gestures that say, hey, you gave me an inch, and I'm going to show you what I can do with this inch. Now, I am tempted to make a joke about more inches that would be referring to my penis, but I will abstain from that because I am a mature adult at this stage of my life. And, um, so yeah, I'm running through these mental simulations on my drive home. Well, listening to another podcast I'm going to tell you about is called, um, I think David Carradine. Something's, um, something's, uh, fuck. I should have thought about it before I start talking about it. It's, um, no, no, no. I think it's George Carlin's Hardcore History. I want to say the name of it. Really cool podcast. He's the historian. Tells you history, but in a, in a cool way. And yeah, I was listening to this five part series on the Mongols, and they were like the craziest fucking, most terrible fucking things I've ever heard of. And it really crazy stuff. But um, that's in the background. I'm just think I'm not thinking about Genghis Khan, um, you know, cutting everybody's heads off and raping everybody and uh, doing his thing. I'm thinking about. Um, what am I going to do? I'm going to cash in on this little lunch opportunity. And what, how's it going to play out? What kind of conversation are we going to have? What kind of demeanor am I going to adopt? Am I going to be seductive and coy? Am I going to be exuberant and charming? Am I going to be mysterious and intriguing? What, what are my different options? And that's like the actor in me. I'm, I'm, I'm playing out different ways I, I, I can perform this. And and, and because I'm, I'm more tripolar now, which is the name of this tri- the, <laughs> of this podcast, and, and the general idea I'm kind of conveying, uh, this this idea that I, I'm striving to be tripolar. I'm striving to be able to remove myself from myself and see myself from a third person, so to speak, to evaluate the way I'm behaving, the thoughts I'm having, things I want to do, want to say, and to be able to look at them from a more objective standpoint and say, hey, one, is this kind of a normal reaction? Not saying it has to be. Is it normal? Uh, Two, in the past, what has happened when we have taken this type of approach? Has it it yielded us any any good results? And three, because there's always got to be a third thing, how about uh, we make three, will we regret having done this? Would, would, would the, the third poll, if we're seeing ourselves from this perspective, would, would we agree with the decision this guy is going to make? And, and, you know, so I'm just looking at it from that type of perspective. And I realize, hey, look at what I'm doing. I'm doing what I always used to do. I'm getting wrapped up in fantasy. I'm experiencing previews of different potential outcomes, and I'm getting attached to the results. I'm getting afraid of the things that I'm afraid of in them. I'm I'm getting turned on by the things I'm turned on by in them. I'm experiencing some subset of those emotions uh, for, for a scenario that hasn't even transpired. And that's the way my brain naturally functions. And I realized, well, realizing this, that what I was feeling in regards to these different automatic simulations was very low volume. And what I mean by that is like like radio volume. It's, it, it, it was a greatly decreased version of what I would normally feel. Normally, I mean unmedicatedly, um, less o- self-aware. So I'm experiencing this. I'm feeling some subset of an emotional experience that that I might be different scenarios and playing out in my mind. One of which maybe I I end up uh, going down on her in, in the office and making her quiver and orgasm and just she's shaking and swaying. And, it's the most incredible experience she's ever had. Another in which I'm, you know, just looking her in the eyes and just letting her look me in the eyes and just experiencing that moment and letting it play out. 
another in which I'm just, you know, we're her friend, and I just say, hey, let's just be friends. You know, so all, all these different things, and it sounds crazy talking about them. And it is crazy, and that's what the fucking point of this podcast is for me to actually let you see kind of some crazy stuff and what, what it is, what it means, what it's like to experience, and if we dissect it, what we can make of it and how it might apply to you. So I'm having all these thoughts, feeling all these things, and I realize that I'm feeling them on a much, much diminished uh, scale than I would naturally, and that troubled me, and that's what reminded me I do have a disability, but right now it's neatly packaged. It's it's suppressed by the pills that I take every day. It is weighted down. It has a leash on it, and for all intents and purposes, thank God for that, because maybe I would have more of a chance with this girl and more a more what you name it exchange now because I'm not getting married to these emotions I have for things that haven't even happened. I mean it's one thing to be the type of guy who overreacts to things that happen. That drives people away. If you're the type of guy who overreacts to things that didn't happen, oh my God, you're in for it. So uh, it's cool. I was aware that the role that these medications and my sort of cognitive behavioral self-awareness therapy, whatever you want to call it, is, is yielding me because I'm at least seeing that uh, the folly of my own my own thoughts and feelings. And, and there's a certain genius in it. There's something beautiful in it. There's something beautiful about being able to experience something that hasn't happened as if it were happening. And that's why I can write movies, because I can feel what these people who don't really exist, that are based on people who really exist, and based on on combinations of, of different human experiences and different, you know, spirits of things, of events, of of just what it means the, the, to the point it can't even be defined in words, but my job is to try to put it into words and try to give it form and voice and character and make it something you can identify with, that you can connect with, that speaks to you and your individual human experience, even though you've never met me, even though these people you're watching on this screen are just people pretending to be this guy I made up. That's all possible because of the things that are weird about me. And so I guess what I'm saying in this podcast is this is just an example of being tripolar, being able to identify that weirdness about yourself and realize how it's useful, what's cool about it, what's nice about it, what's unique about it, and what is destructive about it, what's scary about it, what's potentially destructive about it, and being able to differentiate and make decisions based on those evaluations. And this is sounding a little too clinical, I feel like, at this point. But, um, yeah, I think it's kind of cool that I was able to do that, and, and but it, it got me thinking and it scared me because I realized, you know, fuck, what am I? I'm, I'm not me. I'm a version of me that's, that's numbed, that's uh, forbidden from feeling the full extent of, of these, and it's pragmatically uh, very smart to not let myself feel those things in ways that people wouldn't normally feel them through medication and through you name it. But part of me is really um, fucked with that I'm not a person that I could I can't even really explain it but I, I want to say that some 
form of what I'm trying to articulate is the reason of bipolar people and people who have personality disorders, people who have things like this, why they stop taking their medications. It's because these things try to redefine you. These things reshape you. And what's weird is when you remember, it's like when you remember your dreaming and then you want to wake up, that's what it's like. That's a really good way of explaining it. When you remember that because you're on your medications, you're not experiencing the world the way you used to. And and parts of that experience were great. You miss. You want it back. And you're impatient. And uh, you, you feel like you're missing out. You feel like you're being tricked. You know that, that what's his name, Steve Nash, John Nash, something Nash. Uh, the guy a beautiful mind was based on, he recently died. And that was his whole thing in that movie. He didn't know what was real and what wasn't. And he thought the medications he was taking were shielding him from this reality that he was helping the government crack its code and, you know, these things that I guess were made up. But, but to him, he just couldn't tell what was real and what wasn't. And it's really tragic, and there's something very simple about that idea, very understandable about that idea, and that's just that we as human beings want to have an identity. And when our identity is sacrificed, often for the benefit of others, or at least that's the way it feels, you know, I'm I'm going to take these pills because it makes me behave the way I should. It makes me able to hold down a job. It makes me able to be a better husband. It makes me able to do X, Y, Z more appropriately. It makes me less embarrassing. It makes me less, you name it, whatever. And it's like a sacrifice. It's like, all right, I'll take one for the team. I'll take these fucking things. But there's a lot of good that comes with it. It prevents you from so many bad things. And it's just a weird thing. Maybe that's why I want to drink a little while I'm doing this podcast because it returns me a little more towards, like, I would say my natural state, maybe, when I'm on this magic. It, it, and I don't know. I don't know exactly where I'm going with this. But what I'm getting at is something that's kind of sad, I guess, and it's kind of weird. And, and um, and that's this idea that I will never be somebody that is the same guy he was the last time I saw him. Uh, I'm in flux. I am in human beings. When we're born, we go through a period of learning, a period of shaping, a period of molding for a certain number of years. It's most intense when we're very young and it gradually lessens and lessens to the point where we just are that thing. The, the same way clay is, uh, you know, you put the clay in the, in the oven and, and it goes from what you've shaped it into into something defined and, and finite and permanent, at least you know, in that sense of the word, obviously you can break a pot. But um, there's something about people like me where it's like the clay never hardens. Or the clay does harden, but it's very easy to make it melt again. And then when it melts, you have to try to shape it again and let it harden again and it's it's just not being able to fit in, not being able to clearly and consistently and permanently identify yourself as as a certain thing. And this isn't unique, I don't think, to people with personality disorders. I think in mood disorders, I, I think it's something that we all go through in, in different degrees and, and for different reasons. You know, it's not just biological reasons, you know. 
that happens with race, that happens with culture, that happens with, you know, it's like, what am I? What what club am I in? What Everyone has that to a degree, but with me, I think it's very, on a very fundamental level, I'm not one thing. And that's why I like stuff like this, where I can give myself some definition through telling a story, an anecdote, hosting a conversation, doing something that make me someone that uh, I I know who I am. It's what I want. I want to know who I am. And I won't ever get that, I don't think, because of the way I'm I'm hardwired. And I think that's the, the curse, is that I don't get to be normal. I don't get to be a guy who knows who he is and, and, and who is known a certain way by others and who is consistently playing this role to these people. I don't know that I can ever be a husband and a father and a, um, an employee and a, whatever it is permanently. And that's kind of the tragic part of it. But on the upside, I think I can be a lot of things to a lot of people and bring a lot of joy and excitement and, and, and the insight and stuff to a lot of people. And maybe if I look at it in a positive light, you know, I get things that you don't get to get because I'm that way, because I'm the pot that doesn't harden. Um, you know, I don't I don't have to be apologetic. I don't have to be fake. I don't ever have to be something that I don't want to be. I can, I don't know what I am exactly, but I, I know what I'm not. And I, I don't have to adopt some bullshit lifestyle. I don't have to adhere to all the societal norms that most people do. You know, if I want to try to have sex with three strippers in Vegas while I'm doing drugs, you know, I can't. I'm not saying that's the goal. Uh, But it's cool that I, like, I can do what I want. I'm free. And there's something nice about that. And, um, you know, I, I, not just from a carnal sort of hedonistic standpoint, but from every standpoint. It's like I, I can do what I want in my life. I'm, I'm just not tied down by some sense of this is my duty, this is my place, this is my whatever. Um, this kind of went in a direction I wasn't planning it to, but... I think we're kind of we kind of got at something here. I I feel like if I would have had the right guest, and maybe in the future I will, we could have gotten more into what this is. Maybe I stretch some chords with some some of you guys listening. Um, I'll keep you posted on what happened with this lady. But um, yeah, it's weird because you know I think a part of me that's really deep down that I really tell to shut the fuck up, thinks that there's someone out there that's going to get me and is going to help me define myself and is going to be a part of that definition and is going to, I don't know, love me and that I'm going to be become who I am as a result of someone else and what I'm giving to someone else and giving me and you know, like like love. And um it's probably pretty natural to want that. But uh yeah, I mean love's not permanent either, is it? Love's kind of an emotional state, isn't it? There's different kinds of love. The Greeks knew that. We don't know that. We don't have different words for love. The Greeks have agape and um like, I don't remember. I would have sounded so smart if I remembered all that right now. But, uh, yeah, I should edit it later so it sounds like I did. No, they, they have different words for different kinds of love. There's, like, uh, brotherly love. There's sexual love, like erotic love. I think it's eros, they call it. There's different types of love. And they intersect and, and you know... Um, but but they're unique in themselves. And 
So I, I think I can experience these different forms of love and compartmentalize it with different people. And, you know, it's it'll be cool to see what happens with this girl. And there's so many girls that it could happen with. That who knows what could happen with. That's cool. It's exciting. I, I meet so many girls all the time. Um, you know, whenever I'm out, whenever I'm at work, and whenever I'm, you know, because I'm at that age where I'm, I'm 26 and single and I'm a, you know, I'm a good looking, sharp, great guy, blah, blah, blah. But it, I'm in a position where I'm, I'm exposed to a lot of different potential mates, and, and it's kind of exciting. And there's so much there we could get into, and we will in future episodes. But there's, oh, God, there's so many topics that are coming to mind and have been uh, just kind of stemming from romance alone, sexual attraction alone. Um, weird things about sex like think about it like have you watched porn probably right all the dudes listening yeah, you're probably watching porn while listening to this um, you know weird there's things in porn that are like consistent that are weird uh, and when I say weird it's like if I were an alien looking at earth and I were seeing, you know, us as these animals, and I'm like, hey, look at that, and look what they do. And then something I would be like that about would be, it would point, I'm like, look at these, these, these guys. They, okay, so the, there's, they get guys, a guy, and they get a girl, and the guy takes all these pills, right? So, like, his genitals get really hard, and they get, take these guys with really big genitals. And they get really hard, right? And then they take these women with really big, big everything, like big breasts that they and they put plastic in the in the breasts to make them bigger, right? So, so, so it's kind of like theatrical. It's like it's like like when they do plays, you know, they make everything big, including the dicks and the tits and all that. And and then the guy, um, they usually have a storyline for some reason, uh, as if it's it's got to have some type of narrative. And, it's usually like um, someone's walking in on someone doing something, and then it turns to fucking. Uh, it could be anything. It's ending in fucking. And the acting's going to be terrible. And uh, you're going to wonder why there's any acting to begin with. But so anyway, so these, these humans, they, they put on a, a fake story where the, these people who have giant genitals uh, have some type of brief interaction that very unnaturally escalates to full-on unprotected intercourse. Uh, the women moan and yell and love it, and the guys uh, are pretty quiet. They don't make a whole lot of noise. They try to stay out of frame. You don't usually see their face. They put, like, a hand behind their back. They really, you know, you just, they, you know, they, they tell me that you're focused on the, uh, on the vaginal area, and, um, uh, and just kind of that contact. And and then so what these guys do, they're actually watching these films, right? Usually in the, the you know, confines of their homes, um, locked away in dark rooms with doors locked. And, and they're, they're touching themselves, uh, presumably imagining that they are, in fact, the larger gen- genital man who is um, having sex with this, this woman who is very loud in her... Uh, expressions of enjoying it. And um, traditionally, the male performer will um, ejaculate on the female performer's face. And the uh, guys watching this at home will then ejaculate, uh, often in concert with the uh, the male performer, uh, pretending they are also ejaculating on this woman's face. So at the end of the day, you have... Uh, an actor uh, having male ejaculate sprayed on her face. Well, thousands to hundreds of thousands to maybe millions of other men around the world pretend they are also shooting their sperm on this woman's face. Uh, Of course, they're the only guy there. It's not like there's thousands of guys in, in each other's fantasies. But So that's what they do, and, and they do it pretty regularly. Um, they they seem to like watching uh, this behavior. They don't 
experience in their real life that their wives and uh, their mates don't seem to generally take part in. Um, and uh, yeah, so 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 apparently these these people really want that on some level. Apparently, there's there's so much there that that they don't even understand and are not aware of. Like, why do they like it when the men shoot their future possible babies of themselves on the woman's face? Uh, why there? Right? Uh, is it symbolic? Is it is it a way of saying like that's I own that face? That's look at that. What are you, I mean, what are you doing? What are, you, what are they doing? I don't know. The women seem to be okay with it because they're getting paid. Um, sometimes maybe they really want it. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, that's what they're into. And um, women don't watch it unless it's with other women. Like, perform unless it's two girls, which is a whole other thing that they're, uh, you know, getting off to. But, and the guys love it when it's two women, too. We're not sure why yet. Our, uh, our guys are looking into it. But, uh, yeah, everybody's cool with, it, with when two uh, attractive females are, are going at it. Guys and girls alike are, are like, pretty much give it a thumbs up. And, and the men will still ejaculate while um, watching them lady, those ladies go at it. And so there's so many weird things about us. I just talk about them. And... Uh, this is a platform for me to do so. And what's funny is this is going to come back and bite me in the ass at some point. And someone's going to listen to this and, you know, I'm going to pass it for promotion. Or, you know, but fuck that. I'm going like, to I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a great writer. Um, and hopefully I could be other stuff at the same time and whatever. I'm not going to talk about all this shit right now. But, um, you know, it's going to bite me in the ass I talk about these things that are interesting and they're true. Um, as if I'm the only guy who jerks his dick off. Come on. You guys all jerk off. Everybody jerks off. Even, you know, the ladies are probably, you're flicking, you're flicking. Um, you're having fun down there too, I bet you. You're just even more discreet about it. You don't need to porn it like the guys do so much. Anyways, so what did we talk about? Let's kind of re- recap today's show. Talked about um, my disability claim. We talked about sales. We talked about uh, a story about me encountering a beautiful woman with. I'm not going to describe her. We've been keeping her identity pretty much a secret. I'm doing this for you. You. You know who you are, special lady. Um. Interesting when when you hear this, if you hear this, what our relationship will have been up to that point. Will we have had any more contact? Will uh, we be friends? Will we have been lovers? Will we have been... I don't know. Um, Another trippy thing, too. Time. The sequence of time. What we experience, we put into narrative naturally. So like she told me, she has a boyfriend. So that precludes us having any magical experiences. Well, she has a boyfriend. She didn't have a boyfriend. That tells me she, you know, she's down. Like, let's see what happens. Just the compartmentalization of that. It's interesting because it has to do with time. It's like... If this was before I was in this commitment or after I'm in this commitment, then it's a different story. And, uh, you know, it makes sense. You know, overanalyzing something that doesn't need to be overanalyzed. But I think it's interesting that we, it's so, you know, anti intuitive to try to not think in the confines of time because that's just we're programmed seemingly to do so. But in, in terms of just the the rawness of an experience, that doesn't necessarily have to be confined to time. And that's an idea I'm not sure really makes sense even. Um, it's something I'll try to figure out and, and get back to you guys on that. But, um, uh, <laughs> it's been 
are fun, right? Not good, um, good time, I think. I think we all, uh, I think we can all say this is a great idea to, to, to do this episode. All right. Well, who's the sponsor today? The sponsor today is Harry's Razors. Why buy just one? You can buy two. You can shave with two razors at the same damn time. I've done it. It's fun. It's effective. It's cost effective. It's time effective. It's effective. You take two razors, you put your shaving cream on, one in your left hand, one in your right hand, kind of just mirror the motions, right? Boom. You just shaved in half the time, bro. And you felt like fucking Wolverine doing it. You felt like a badass. That's right. Harry's razor. Harry's.com. I'm pretty sure it's Harry's.com, not Harry's Razors. Let me just <laughs> confirm that. Yep, Harry's.com. Get those razors. Um, you can get the Truman set, 15 bucks. You can, uh, you can get a, a promo code. Uh, if you just Google it. There'll be somebody else's who will have it on there. Uh, you can get like five bucks off. And so 10 bucks, you can get a beautiful set. Razor handle, uh, three razors. Comes with a thing to hold the um, hold the blade. So you don't have to worry about like trying to cut yourself, you know, cutting yourself when you're trying to grab your toothbrush and all that good stuff. Comes with gel, uh, shaving cream or gel, right? Comes in a beautiful box. It's got this ergonomical handle. You can pick what color. There's green. There's orange. There's, you, you know, it's oh my god. You gotta just ugh. You gotta try these razors, man. All right, so there's a sponsor. Um, yeah, this has been fun. Next episode, I'm pretty sure I know who my guest is going to be. I'm not going to announce it yet till I get the confirmation. But um, he is an interesting cat. He is a thinker. He is a talker. Um, I actually met him at work. He's um, he's working on a PhD right now. And, and uh, you know, the, the specific topic is too long for me to say and remember. It's like a whole sentence was like his major. You know, fucking it's crazy. But, um... No, it's something very specific he's studying. And it has to do with race. It has to do with um, kind of the evolution of culture. It has to do with uh, the, particularly the, the African-American experience and how it stretches back to uh, from slavery, pre-slavery to today and the ripple effects of um, really of, of cultures and the way that we evolve. Um, that's what I want to talk to him about. And, you know, why do we say we? Is a great question. And that's how I'm going to kick off the next podcast with him, I think. Why do we say we when we're talking about not even necessarily our ancestors, right? When we're talking about people who uh, we identify with ethnically. So, uh, for, for example, um, I'm talking about like when the the colonial empires came, and you know, when 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 the white guys from Europe came to America and fucking took it over and knocked out the um, Native Americans, right? So if I were talking about that, I might say, well, you know, what we did was wrong, but it laid the groundwork for civilization. Like, why say we? I wasn't there. I wasn't a part of that. My ancestors probably weren't even a part of that. My ancestors were like. Maybe they were. I know. I have some in Italy. I have some in probably Germany and Lithuania. Uh, fucking odds are they're not on boats going to America. I mean, not fucking killing Native Americans. Why do I even say we? Because what we would mean is the people who lived near or are from or I or look like people who did this. Uh, I am somehow a part of that club, and. I think it's interesting and worth having a long talk about because without knowing it, we identify with historical entities that we may or may not have any uh, lineal connection to. And the ripple effects of those beliefs that we are or are not part of this or that club Oh man, they echo through society today, even in a country like America, and for better or worse. And it's very, very subtle, 
but it's definitely there and it's one of those subtle things that shapes the world in, in very profound ways. It's a tectonic plate of civilization. It's there, it's underneath it all. It's it's you forget it exists, but when it shakes, when it rumbles, when it just when when it's when you're made aware it's there, oh fuck, it fucking shakes everything up, man. There's an earthquake. There's wars, there's genocide, there's laws, there's reforms, there's riots, there's all these things that are coming from those tectonic plates of um these civilizations, these cultures that we descend from or we think we are a part of or whatever it is, these ideas that we're connected to these these people that used to be and, and where did that all stem from and so many interesting topics there. And so that's not going to be so much a, an episode about a internal mental processes like this one was and, and kind of putting you inside the driver's seat of someone with a bipolar disorder and asking those kind of questions and trying to uh, let you empathize with that and feel that and see if you, uh, you know, are, are, are going through something similar or, or, I don't know, whatever the fuck happened today. But it's not going to be like that. It's going to be more external. and But internal, because we're talking about this all fucking... I should have ended this podcast a little while ago. It would have been a stronger note. Anyways, so next episode is going to be interesting as fuck is what I'm getting at. This one, I hope you enjoyed. Um, we're doing great on timing. It's going to be about an hour. we got about three minutes. Um, what should I do for three minutes? Right, I'm going to try to rap like an impossible to rap song that Kendrick Lamar made because I respect that guy. It's called Rigor Mortis. I'm going to freestyle this bitch with no beat. One take. Let's go for it. Okay. Got me breathing with dragons. I cracked the egg in your basket. You bastard, I'm in a mansion with madness. Now just imagine the magic I like to ask. Is don't ask for your favorite rapper. He dead. Amen. He dead. I killed him. Amen. Bitch. And this is rigor mortis, and it's gorgeous when you die. I'll leave recorded in a Morpheus. The Matrix in my mind. I'm out the orbit. You an orphan and a hairdresser combined. I'm on the toilet when I rhyme. If you the ship, then I decline. I climax where you begin, and then I end on cloud nine. And that's important when you morph into an angel in the sky. And don't be forging all my signatures. My listeners reply, tell me that you bite my style. You got a hell of an appetite. I'm going to be here for a while, so buckle up before the ride or knuckle up if you can fight. We always make them duck or die. A suit and tie are suitable and usable in suicide. TSI just might investigate this fucking parasite. He did. Amen. That's what they're telling me. Amen, it's just a celebrity. This is studio felony. Ferragami for many and cool enough for the 70s. Nigga, payback's a bitch and bitch, you've been living in debt with me. That I'm all in especially. Leave a call on his mother voicemail to say that he rests in peace. Bigger chop of the recipe. Wrestling, that's irrelevant. Rather rest at your residence. Whistling to the melody. Couldn't think of a better. The better be on your P and Q. It's just me, J Rock, Soul and Q, Solar System and Barbecue. Nothing else you can do. He did. Amen. He did. Amen. There's a second verse. Fuck, I only got 50 seconds. I'm going to just try to blast through as much of our, as I can and then I'm going to stop. Got me breathing with dragons. I cracked the egg in your basket. You bass and I'm Marilyn Manson. Don't ask for your favorite rapper. I rapped and I made him Casper. I captured the likes of NASA. I passed the weed to the past. I passed... Fuck. I captured the likes of NASA. I passed the weed... My pedigree to fly past you. I passed the weed to the past. We all the sinners. Won't you send us a Bible study faster? You're hypocritically asking is blasphemy. I sat to my casualty and it's casually done. And tell him my salary coming. Lonesome on hundreds. Don't talk to me about no money. The sun is under my feet and I come in peace to compete. I don't run if you have to leap. My statistics go up in weeks and I go visit the nearest creek. And I get busy on a mini MC. Really ridiculous. Anybody can see it's your boy Kendrick is a battery. And I'm charged up as the audacity is charged up. The catastrophe is just electric ran out. Just say, I am fucking that. I got five seconds. And that part gets too hard. I'm going to try again someday. Okay, that's the end. Bye.